So it's time to test out this little camera or this big beast, depending on how you rig it out, uh, and do a review about it. This is the Zcam E2. So I've had a chance to use this camera over the last three months and I've really put this thing uh, through its paces. I've used it in all kinds of different settings, uh, with different lenses, uh, different setups when it comes to the rig itself and things like that. Uh, because there's definitely a lot of good things about this camera and some not so great things that uh, thankfully I found some solutions to it. And I do think if you take the time and kind of work out the little quirks with this camera, then it can be a really, really great uh, filmmaking tool. So the first good thing about this camera is its size. Now, of course, depends how you set it up. So the camera itself is actually really small and surprisingly light. It's only 757 grams. Yet what this camera is able to achieve in this small form factor is pretty amazing. So the first thing that it can do is that it can record 4K video in 10 bit. For those of you who don't know what that means, the higher the bit rate, the better. It means the camera can capture uh, more samples of color. This camera also offers two native ISOs, uh, which always gives it that extra little bit of a boost, especially when you want to film in lower light conditions. Uh, the two native ISOs of this are 500 and 2500. It also comes with a USB-C uh, connection, which uh, is right here on the back of the camera. And what this means is that you can use that connection actually to plug in external SSDs, uh, like the one that I have up here in this cool little handle from SmallRig. Uh, and it allows you to record directly to an SSD instead of using the CFAST cards that this camera natively uh, records to. And of course the other advantage of that is that SSDs are way, way cheaper than CFAST cards. Another great thing about this camera is the Micro Four Thirds image sensor and mount. And the reason is because if you, for example, use a Metabone speed booster like the one I'm using up here, as the XL 0.64, it will essentially convert this into a full frame camera. So you can get that full frame look and up here I'm using a Canon EF lens, but at the same time, let's say if I want to have a smaller, basically, camera package, then I can put this aside and I can throw in a lens that's pretty much the same equivalent as the other lens, but look how much smaller and also how much lighter now this whole rig becomes, which makes it easier to zoom in a lot and get nice tight telephoto shots without again having to carry this giant lens with you. And as you can see, it's easy to switch between the two. So again, it's really cool to have actually a micro four thirds mount, I think, on cameras these days because of the, the fact that with that speed booster, you can easily convert it to a APS-C size or, or even a full frame camera. Another thing I really love about this camera are the Sony NPF batteries that it uses, uh, which means that, well, let's say with a battery like this, as you can see, this is the same actually battery that I've been using it with my packet uh, 6K and 4K cameras. Uh, and it's because of uh, the fact that it you know, powers the camera for a long time. With this one battery, actually, I can power this for four hours. But if you also want to, you can you have a DC plug up here on the top. And that allows me, see, with this one little cable uh, to plug in my monitor. So this way I don't have to carry another battery here on the back of the monitor and add to the weight and all that stuff. Uh, and then uh, the same thing up here, if you, for example, have a device that uses USB uh, connection, you can plug in a USB here device and it will power that. And if you guys want to get these batteries, I'll put a link for them in the description of this video. But as you see, the, the advantage of having this uh, Sony NPF style battery mount built into the camera is that uh, you don't need another kind of rig or way to attach these batteries like I do when I'm using it with the packet 6K or 4K cameras. And then another thing is that uh, these batteries are just a lot easier to get. Uh, they're, they're cheaper and, and also they come in different sizes, which I really like. Another interesting thing about this camera is that it records an Apple ProRes and H.265, which 
To be honest, at first I was like, uh, I don't know if I want to record in the, you know, it's basically an MP4 type of file that will come come out of the camera, but I was really surprised once I actually started filming in that codec and it many times you will be forced to film in that codec when you want to use some of the higher frame rates and some of the other options that I'll kind of get into but despite that I, I was really surprised because the quality coming out of the, the H.265 uh, compression is actually really really good it's uh, sometimes I would say that I didn't even see a difference between the ProRes files and the H.265 files. Now the ProRes files are much, much bigger, whereas the H.265 files are tiny compared to it, which is another advantage of it. Uh, and they're both actually recorded in 10 bits. So really the main difference is just the amount of compression that's being applied in, in that codec. But really, if you were to again compare this to the upper ProRes, it's really hard to tell the two apart. Now this camera, if you didn't know, can actually record in 4K up to 160 frames per second so you can get that really nice slow motion something to be aware of with that is that 160 frames per second in 4k only works if you're shooting in the wider aspect ratio where the top and the bottom of the sensor basically isn't being used so this effectively gives you that cinema scope kind of a cinematic aspect ratio now if for example you do want to shoot in the standard uhd or 16 by 9 aspect ratio then uh, you can do that in 4K, but then you'll be dropping down to 120 frames per second, which again produces beautiful slow motion. Also, technically this camera can record in 240 frames per second in HD, uh, but I say technically because even though the possibility is there, I would not recommend you filming that because it's just the quality is horrendous. Uh, in 240 frames per second, it re literally you see the artifacting on the edges. You limit to, to only recording in H.265, and I think that's when that codec really starts showing its limitation. And it's just at the end of the day, it's not a, a f image that I would say is usable. So I, I definitely would not recommend recording in in uh, 240 frames per second. And again, it's one of those things that I think camera makers do these days where. They'll put up a spec there on the spec sheet and people get excited about it, but then when it comes to real world actual use of that feature, it's not always quite there. So now talking about the bad things about this camera, I would say the biggest, biggest negative thing about this camera is the way you go through the menu system. Because I can't really say that the menu themselves are really bad. Uh, because they're, they're kind of you know simple and, and easily laid out. It's just the fact that to navigate through the menus, you're using these buttons. And these buttons on the camera, uh, and just overall the build quality, like the body itself, the, the, the kind of the metal housing feels very sturdy, but the buttons on this camera are horrendous. Sometimes you click and it doesn't actually, you know, actually activate or do anything. And sometimes I click and it almost double clicks. So you gotta be very kind of careful with this. Uh, and just, yeah, overall, it's, it's not a great way here to navigate through the menu system and change the settings. So if you think that you can just buy this camera and not have to get any accessories for it, Think again because, uh, well, first of all, you don't have a monitor. There is like a tiny little monitor here on the top that's pretty much useless. Uh, so you will have to get another monitor. Now you can connect a phone to it, which then that allows you also to change some of the settings and things like that. So that makes it a lot easier. Or you can connect a really cool monitor like the one I have up here from Port Keys. And with a little modification, you can actually use this monitor to help navigate um, basically through the menu directly up here. And this monitor is actually touch screen. So it's basically you, you can change all your settings right here using a touch screen. Uh, but that's something to consider because that is something you're gonna have to spend money on. And also it makes the camera right away bigger. Uh, but like I said, you pretty much have to get a monitor regardless, you're gonna have to rig it up. You're gonna have to add accessories to it. And that actually brings me to the next point is that even though the camera itself is nice and small, uh, it's maybe great if you're, for example, just going to throw it up on a gimbal or, or if you want to mount it on like a drone or something, because then, you know, it has the a, a camera control kind of connections and all that stuff. But if you're going to use this for handheld work, it is horrible, especially if you put a bigger lens in, on this camera, because then you don't even have anywhere to really to grab uh, onto. So again, the small size is a good thing and a bad thing, depending on how you're going to use the camera. So you're definitely going to need some kind of a cage. First of all, if you want to really securely attach a monitor or any other accessory, I'm using the small rig cage and it's been great. It allows me to connect you know, a monitor properly and I can connect you know, various other accessories and things like that because there's quarter 20 attachments all over the place. But also, like I said before, I'm using the small rig here side handle, which also happens to house my SSD that I'm recording onto. 
And with this, it is a lot better. It's, you know, you can hold it safely just by the handle. And it just makes it a lot sort of a better run and gun, kind of a handheld type of camera rig. Now, getting back to the build quality of the camera, uh, when it comes to the CFAST door that are up here on the side, they're, again, just at the way that the buttons have been built, this, that CFAST flap, basically that opening is horrible, horrible. <laughs> so many times I've struggled with that when I was using CFAST cards at the beginning of this camera, and it's just a nightmare trying to get that thing to open. Uh, and uh, yeah, you pretty much need some kind of a, like a little screwdriver or some kind of tool to, to kind of pry that open. And in fact, it gets so ridiculously annoying trying to open and swap the CFAST cards in this camera that that's one of the reasons why I just switched to SSDs. Uh, and, and just haven't basically bothered using CFAST cards with this camera, even when sometimes I, I would maybe want to have a smaller form factor, like when I had it on a gimbal. So again, it's just something to be aware of, is that you either rip that door out, but then your CFAST card is going to be exposed, or you, I don't know, replace it with something else, because it is, it is honestly really, really horrible. And that's the same, like, when I was talking about the quality of the buttons and things like that. It's like, it's just not all the way there. Now, another thing to really watch out when you're working with this camera is whenever you're shooting in low light, because even though it has that dual native ISO, it's, the difference is not as big. It's, like I said, 500 and 2500. Is, uh, it gives you a bit of a bump there, uh, but it's definitely not as much, for example, as the packet 4K or 6K cameras. And it's also, I, I think maybe the, the camera, kind of the, the ISO rating on this sensor, I think it's been a little bit bumped up because to be honest, uh, in my experience, when you're shooting at 2500, it looks a lot more noisy than and it really it should be. And so a lot of times I'll just end up either adding extra light to make sure that I am not shooting at that higher ISO, or if I have no choice and I have to shoot with that, then uh, in post I'll end up uh, having to clean up a lot of that noise because just natively when you look at the footage it is pretty noisy so low light performance is not horrible but it's not great when you compare it to some of the other cameras on the market these days now when you're shooting in good lighting conditions then you know, the killer's camera produces beautiful images and like i said regardless of whether you're shooting in prores or h265 i think the quality that this camera produces in 4k though uh, is really really beautiful uh, the, the images look sharp there's plenty of information the highlights and the shadows uh, and it's just a, a pleasure to work with this camera and kind of almost reminds me like now that I've kind of rigged it out like this and I have this little monitor that allows me to control it using the touch screen uh, it almost reminds me of like a little like a, like a small like a really small Arri Alexa or like a red camera because it is at the end of the day it's a true cinema camera and it's capable of a lot uh, now, is it the best deal these days? Because I know a lot of questions that I've been getting online is, should I be getting this camera or the Pocket 6K or maybe the 4K cameras? And comparing it to those cameras, which I will be doing another follow-up video where I'm kind of going side by side and, and I'm comparing all the different features of, of this to the Pocket 4K. Uh, but in this video, I'll kind of quickly tell you that it's a different camera. The, like I kind of mentioned, the size is smaller, they can shoot those higher frame rates and things like that. But for example, where you're losing out maybe with this camera is the fact that it doesn't really have this true kind of a raw recording mode. There is that Z raw, but it's not something that you want to be really working with. And so if you really love shooting in raw, like I, for example, I love the, the B raw on the packet 4K and 6K cameras. And, uh, and the fact that it allows you to afterwards to change all the settings like ISO or white balance and things like that. Also just the file sizes that you get with it and uh, you get the kind of image quality that it retains. When you compare it to this, it's, I mean, it's great image quality, don't get me wrong, in Apple ProRes and H.265, but it is not raw and it is 10 bit also. It's lower bit rate than the Pocket 4K and 6K cameras, which means again, that's probably one of the reasons why when you're shooting in low light and you really start pushing the, the images and color grading, you, the image is going to fall apart a little bit quicker than, a, a, for example, the raw image from the Pocket 4K camera. So those are the kind of things to kind of keep in mind. But if you want a camera that's smaller, that lasts way longer with batteries, uh, that has shoots higher frame rates, then I think this might be the winner. But again, I'll do a side-by-side -side comparison of this to the Pocket 4K in an upcoming video. And anyways, hopefully you guys enjoyed this video. If you did, let me know in the comment section below. 
Uh, and uh, if you haven't already, go to my website at tomantosfilms.com, subscribe to my newsletter so you're notified when I do release the follow-up video with further tests and also with sort of my details of how I rigged out this camera and why and how I kind of found these different workarounds to some of the problems with this camera. Anyways, my name is Tom Antos and I'll see you guys in the next one. Bye.